if you're compromised by too much sin, it's too much. It is psychologically true that each of us should open ourselves up to the tragedy of being. It is psychologically true that we should pick up our tragic burdens and crosses, die continually, and renew our souls continually. It may be more than psychologically true as well. It may be a truth of cosmic significance. That is the death and resurrection celebrated by Easter. And it is time for us to wake up, become conscious, and recognize it as such. It is not possible to encapsulate within any finite written account the total import of the idea of Christ's death and rebirth. The impossible claim of the bodily resurrection of one man, conjoined with the notion that this event was both of world-redeeming and cosmic significance, simply cannot be understood once and for all within any singular frame of interpretation. Even for die-hard atheists of the scientific type, think Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, a great mystery remains. Why has this strange and thoroughly implausible story exercised such immense impact? It is because each life is a tragedy, tainted by malevolence. It is because life is suffering, as we all are, each of us vulnerable and ignorant, made all too frequently bitter, resentful and angry because of just that, and more than willing to make things worse in that anger. But we all admire courage and the accompanying willingness to abide by the truth, no matter how terrible, in the face of that suffering. We all recognize in such courage and truth, at least by our admiration of it, an antidote to the catastrophe of life. We all know that in the absence of such courage and truth, mere catastrophe degenerates all too frequently into hell. Imagine that acceptance of vulnerability and ignorance is the precondition for growth. Imagine that confrontation with the terrible unknown, with its paralyzing manifestations of tragedy and malevolence, is necessary to catalyze both wisdom and maturity. Imagine, finally, that human consciousness plays some central and as of yet poorly understood role in the reality of the cosmos, at least as necessary observer. Imagine all of that. Then ask yourself, what is the absolute hypothetical limit of human attainment when vulnerability and ignorance are fully and completely accepted, when the unknown is squarely confronted, and when consciousness is given its due as the very center of the world? That's Christ's acceptance of the crucifix. That's his willingness to be betrayed, subject to the evil of his closest companions and the state, and his embrace of brokenness and death. It is pure truth that even a small leaven of humility and courage engenders resilience, progress, and growth. It is pure truth that resentful rejection of the price of finite being multiplies suffering endlessly and unnecessarily. What is the ultimate expression of those truths taken to their final conclusion? Who is to say who we are and what we might be capable of achieving if we develop the courage to accept our terrible fates, live in truth, and stumble uphill? This is the question posed by Christianity in its very essence. Would you put everything you have and everything you are on the line so that you could learn to conduct yourself in the best possible manner? Would you be willing to allow who you might be to continually and painfully triumph over who you currently are? In the most ancient religious language, would you sacrifice what you love most to God to find out who and what you are? We are, in the final analysis, neither structure nor chaos. Each of us is instead best understood as a process, as a living, dynamic process, as the very process by which what we know what we know so insufficiently, is transformed into what could yet be. That is the process by which our continued forward movement through life is constantly and inevitably dependent. To understand that and to welcome it, that is voluntary acceptance of the necessity of eternal transformation as an alternative to nihilistic despair or desperate and fatal identification with the state. 
This is the idea enacted during the ceremony of the Christian Eucharist. Incorporation of the body of Christ is the symbolic transformation of the participant, not into a believer of a set of facts, religious though those facts may appear, but into the active imitator of Christ, into the person willing to undergo whatever death is necessary to bring about the next and better state of being, into the person willing to embrace his or her confrontation with the tragedy and malevolence of life, to learn from that process of embrace and to move one step closer in consequence to the eternally receding city of God. The idea of the dying and resurrecting God is one of the oldest ideas of mankind, widespread and exceptionally variant in its forms. It forms part of the set of presuppositions that underlie the most ancient shamanic rituals, carried over, perhaps, from the Stone Age itself. A small failure, a small disappointment, frustration or disenchantment engenders within us a small death, a small descent into the underworld, a small requirement for rebirth. A large failure produces a proportionately large catastrophe and transformation. When you are compelled to talk to someone because you face divorce or the failure of a treasured ambition or the illness or death of someone close, you are walking yourself through the eternal narrative. Stability, crisis, death, transformation, rebirth. That's the story of our lives. That's the fall and the re-establishment of paradise. The idea that the Savior is the figure who dies and resurrects is a representation in dramatic or narrative form of the brute fact that psychological progress, indeed learning itself, requires continual death and rebirth of lesser and greater magnitude. It is not sufficient either to abandon tradition and structure entirely in a headlong and irresponsible rush towards the anomalous and revolutionary. Structure is insufficient, but it is still necessary, and the ethical requirement for respecting and maintaining it is still of paramount import. We each must as well similarly avoid falling prey to the temptation of identifying with the chaotic, depressing, anxiety-ridden and nihilism-inducing state of affairs engendered by the terrible confrontation with the genuinely unknown. Even when thrust into the underworld by the dread events of our life, we must not characterize ourselves as permanent inhabitants of that dark and dread place, lest we lose hope, despair, and seek revenge. To progress psychologically, you must let go, sacrifice, time and again in the face of successive obstacles. You must abandon those things that, and often those people who, are impeding your progress, despite the fact that you may have held them very close to your heart. When you're wrong, when you've missed the mark, when you've sinned, because that is the meaning of sin, you must let the part of you that is wrong and aiming improperly die. Then you must allow the new spirit manifesting itself within to spring to life. That new spirit, that's the terrible information contained in whatever error you committed in living conjunction with the now transformed structures you originally employed to frame the situation. That new spirit, it's a manifestation as well, and in other words, of the potential within you that had not yet been called forth by the previous travails of your life. Christ is, symbolically, the way and the truth of life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Embracing the process of voluntary death and rebirth that is identical with psychological development means determining to move forward and upward despite the horrors of life. It means as well, symbolically speaking, rejuvenating the dead father or rescuing him from stagnation and deterioration in the eternal underworld. Forthright individual confrontation with the unknown renews the individual but also catalyzes cultural revitalization. This is the essence of Christian ritual and belief, articulated as a psychological principle. We must identify with that part of ourselves that is always stretching beyond what we currently know and has the faith to let go of old certainties so that new patterns of being can be brought into place. 
It is through identification with the process symbolized by Easter that we are each redeemed and our culture revivified and salvaged. We are all the slaves of Pharisees and lawyers, of those who place dogma above spirit at the cost of spirit. We are all subject to betrayal by ourselves and by all those who surround us. We are all facing extinction in the most torturous of manners. But there is a spirit within us with sufficient courage to confront the true horrors of existence forthrightly, to allow the transformation, even death, that such confrontation catalyzes to occur and to leap forward renewed. How is it that life might prevail in the face of death and hell, with arms open, embracing its fate? We are all fallen creatures, and we all know it. We are all separated from what should be and thrown into the world of death and despair. We are all brutally crucified on the cross that is the reality of life itself. To rebel against that fate merely worsens it, transforming what could be mere tragedy into something indistinguishable from hell. To argue bitterly and despair around the deathbed of a loved one, to take a single example, is to turn all the pain of death and loss into something far worse. To accept instead? Is that simultaneously to transcend? It's certainly courage and truth and perhaps even love and these three forces are something to behold. Are they more powerful than despair and the desire for vengeance? That is the Christian suggestion. And the Christian command? To act out the proposition that courage and truth and love are more powerful than death and despair and to accept what transpires as a consequence. That is Easter and the death and resurrection of Christ. We forget or remain blind to such things at our great peril.